Hi, everybody. How's it going? Oh, come on. You could do better than that. How's it going? Yeah, much better. So hi, I'm Saran. Uh, I'm founder of Code Newbie. Do I get to press a button? And something happens. That's great. Um, so this is my first time in Colorado. I'm here with my husband, who's right there. Husband, raise your hand. Good job. You're doing great. Uh, very. Seven years. Seven years. Uh, but we flew in from right outside New York City in Jersey. Uh, and we've been looking for an excuse to come to Colorado, so thank you so much, Jeff, for the excuse. And there's some pretty big differences between Manhattan and here. Um, <laughs> I'm most shocked at just the high quality air that you all breathe. <laughs> like, I just, I could take in a deep breath. I'm not coughing, I'm not dying. I don't taste tar, it's amazing. Uh, in Manhattan, we have a, uh, we're, we're just, you know, overrun by rats. And in Boulder, you're overrun by bikes. You have a huge bike problem. Uh, I, I never, I just didn't know there were that many people who enjoyed physical activity of any kind. So that's pretty impressive. That's uh, where put all of them. <laughs> there they go. That's the problem. Uh, but the mountains, it's a little too much. You're doing way too much. We know that you're better than us. It's fine. We get it. I don't need a mountain at every single turn that I'm here. It's just too much. Um, but yesterday, we spent the day in Boulder. And uh, I'm going to tell you a serious story. We had a near-death experience. Um, I haven't told anyone this. I just need to get this off my chest before we you know, really get into the talk. Um, we decided that we wanted to go to the beach. So naturally, we went to the Colorado Reservoir. And we got there, and it was just us and the parking lot guys. There's nobody else. We walked outside. And in a few minutes, we realized at the exact same time that we heard absolutely nothing. It was dead quiet. There was no traffic. There were no humans. There was no angry yelling or cursing. There was not even like wind rustling through the trees. And I've been watching a lot of Homeland recently. And <laughs> right before anything bad happens in Homeland, there's like 10 seconds of complete silence. So I looked at him and was like, we're about to die. We're <laughs> definitely going to die at any moment. He's like, what are you talking about? I said, look, I saw this last night on Hulu. We, we're definitely going to die. We need to leave immediately. And at that moment, I joke you, I, I kid you not, we heard a leaf fall from a tree. Do you know how terrifying that is? That's, that's like some horror movie crap. You're not supposed to hear like the stem break and then it hit the bark along the way. Like you just don't do that. Um, so I basically risked my life in being here today. So you're welcome. So my talk is called Lucky. And before we begin, uh, I have to give you an official trigger warning. Uh, there's some not so family friendly content in the beginning. And then there's like a moment a third of the way in. So uh, now that I've warned you, it's no longer my responsibility. <laughs> so the last time I gave this talk, uh, I was talking to my, oh, sorry. So we're going to do a pre-talk, which is the talk before the talk about the talk. It's like the talk trailer, kind of. So uh, it's 12.35 AM. It's the night before uh, I gave this talk. And I was talking to my mom. And she called and she said, you know, good luck on your talk. I'm sure you're going to do great. And I said, yeah, it's going to be awesome. Don't worry about it. It's going to be great. I gave this talk like a month ago. It had really good reviews. And actually, let's, let's see what those reviews were. So we went on YouTube to look at how many views it had. It had over 2,000, almost 2,000 views. Uh, and it had only been up for like 10 days. I was just totally crushing it, right? So I said, let's look at some more stats. 14 people liked it. <laughs> and 40 people, not so much. And so I told my mom this, and she said, oh, Saron, we're Ethiopian. That's where that accent came from. It's not racist. I can do that. You can't do that, OK? You can't do that. I can do that. Uh, and, and so she said, Saron, you have to fix your talk. And I go, oh, man, you're right. I totally have to fix it, because I'm doing this again tomorrow, and I really want to make sure it's really good. But how do you know what went wrong, right? It's a, it's a pretty rich, long talk. How do you know what to fix? I have an idea. Let's read the comments. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be filled with rich dialogue, great feedback, constructive criticism, growth criticism, growth feedback, right? Let's see. So let's look at the, the first one. So this shit, that's not funny, this is super serious, uh, is just whining about race and gender. Effing Christ, the Chinese learn about quantum mechanics and are putting quantum satellites in space. And we learn to hate white men. F my Western society up, family am. So first of all, I love white people, OK? I have like three white friends. <laughs> Second of all, what the hell is a family am? I've never, I've never heard of that before. 
And I assumed it was something derogatory, so I looked it up. It means like best friend, like a family. It's something positive, which is very confusing. There's no growth feedback in here. So let's move on to the, the next comment. This one's short and sweet. This is some good brainwashing. Thank you. Um, I, when I do things, I like to do them well, so that's good. Um, you know, my intention is never to brainwash people. It's like not, not my thing. Uh, but if I could brainwash you, that's pretty freaking awesome. That's a great <laughs> skill to have. So, you know, I was, I was a little flattered, but again, no growth feedback in this. So let's go to the next and uh, my, my personal favorite one. How about you talk about coding and not fake societal issues? Effing social justice. Don't worry, I won't say that word. I won't, I won't do that to you. Uh, when, I, when I showed this slide last time, a friend of mine was in the audience and he was sitting next to two women and he's like, I was just praying that you weren't going to say that word. I was, just, I was so scared. I was so scared. Don't worry, I won't do that to you. Uh, but but there's, there's two things. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, I'm shocked that it took this long to get this type of comment. This is the first negative comment, you know, just, just a straight online harassment comment that I've received. And I've been coding for about three years and I'm just so shocked that it took three years. The day that I decided to learn to code, I told my husband, I said, look, we're black. I'm a woman and I have a really big mouth. So if something's gonna happen at some point, you need to be prepared. <laughs> when I went to my first conference, my first tech conference ever was also the first time I spoke. It was at RailsConf. Uh, shout out to RailsConf. I know Martin, a couple people in the audience. Um, I went there, and I was so scared that I designed a T-shirt that said, this is my first conference, please be nice to me, as if a harasser would stop, read it, and then go, oh, this is your first one? I'll have a good time. I'll see you the next one, though. <laughs> I was so afraid of that first conference that I brought my husband, then he was my boyfriend, with me and people thought it was so cute. They said, oh, how romantic, oh, true love. No, that was a security measure. <laughs> That's what that was. It was strictly a security protocol. And I had a lovely time at RailsConf and I blogged about how wonderful people were, but I was very, very afraid. And if I had seen that comment a year ago, it would have slowed me down. Two years ago, it would have quieted me. Three years ago, it would have broken me. And I'm so fortunate that I'm at a place in my career now where I've received so much love and support from a lot of you in this audience that I can read a comment like that the night before I give the same talk and I can just put it on the slide and we can talk about it the next day. So. You ready to do the talk? Yeah, awesome. do it. Cool. Lucky. So two years ago, I was on my very first podcast. I was the guest. It was Ruby Rogues. Show of hands if you've heard of Ruby Rogues, hopefully. Uh, ooh, that's pretty nice. I was on episode 159, and it was called Hacking Education. And it was about my personal journey, learning to code, and being a developer. And in passing, I said, I'm very privileged. And this is uh, what I look like when, when I code. I, I just turn into a cartoon. Uh, and my journey learning to code involved a boot camp and some learning on my own. It was very hard. It was very lonely. And I was talking about this. And one of the panelists, David Brady, said, you know, I'm so shocked that we have a guest who's at four or five levels of intersectionality who just claim to be privileged. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, I have my own podcast now called the Code Newbie Podcast, and we've had some awesome people in the audience on the show. Uh, we do a new episode every Monday, so you should totally subscribe. And we've done over 100 episodes. And my favorite part about the show is I get to ask people, how did you get to where you are? How did you do that? What role did things like privilege have to do with your success? And when I think back to... David's comment, it was very clear that when he thinks about the word privilege, he associates it with race and gender, which oftentimes means that we're talking about racism and sexism. And these are two very, very important issues in our industry, and we see these issues come up quite frequently. Uh, one recent example is by Jesse Frazzle, who used to be a docker, and she's a, an incredible person, very vocal, very open in the community. And there was an article that came out a few months ago that said that one of Docker's star engineers got so many death and rape threats that the company hired private detectives to protect her. Can you imagine that? Private detectives? 
She blogged about her experience about a year ago and said, ever since I started speaking at conferences and contributing to open source projects, I have been endlessly harassed. I've gotten hundreds of private messages on IRC and emails about sex, rape, and death threats. People emailing me saying they jerked off to my conference talk video. You're welcome, by the way. I do appreciate the sass. Is mild in comparison to sending Photoshop pictures of me covered in blood. That's right. I wish I could do my job, something I very obviously love doing, without any of this bullshit. However, that seems impossible at this point. And when she left, she tweeted, I lost something I loved so much, and a small piece of my soul standing up for myself, and I don't know if it was worth it. And that's very sad. That's very, very sad. And so when I think about privilege, I think about the ability to either engage in this type of behavior, or to just simply pretend it doesn't exist because it doesn't affect you. So what does this mean for the rest of us? This means that we have lots of people who are capable, who are passionate, and who are hardworking, and are being routinely pushed out, directly or indirectly, for reasons that have nothing to do with their technical abilities. And that doesn't seem good for them, or frankly, good for us. But the good thing is that we're getting a lot better at addressing these issues. And I have a couple examples. One is Coraline Ada Emke, show of hands if you've heard of Coraline before. Um, she's an incredible person. She created the Contributor Covenant, which is a code of conduct for open source, source projects. And a lot of the tools that uh, we use, including RubyGems and RVM and a bunch of others, uh, have adopted this code of conduct. Second is this example, uh, Tracy Chow, show of hands if you've heard of Tracy Chow. She, oh, you should totally look her up. She's amazing. Uh, a few years ago, she went to the Grace Hopper Conference for the first time, and she'd always heard about this issue of not having enough women in the room, but there were no numbers behind it. There was no, no statistics around it. And she felt like if we're going to have a real conversation about how to fix the problem, we have to be able to quantify that problem. So she started asking companies to volunteer their demographic information. Uh, and she started just a, a, a Google Docs that anyone could contribute to. And she ended up getting, I think it was a couple hundred companies to, uh, to give their stats. And she was a huge reason why bigger companies like Google and Facebook eventually showed their numbers as well. And my third and final one is an engineer named Isis. Uh, she was kind of an accidental advocate. Uh, she was part of a marketing campaign, one of four engineers at her company, One Login. And uh, there was a marketing campaign trying to get people to join the company. And someone took a picture and wrote in the comments something about how she didn't look like an engineer. And she didn't like that. So she started the hashtag, I look like an engineer. And she asked women to take a picture of themselves and share that photo with the hashtag. And it was absolutely beautiful to watch because you get to see all these women from all over the world, different races and, and backgrounds and ages and, and all that showing that I look like an engineer because I am an engineer. So going back to David's concept of privilege, it makes a lot of sense. The way that we talk about privilege is usually tied to race and gender. But I don't like that definition. Because I'm a woman, and I'm a person of color, and I'm drowning in privilege. One of the most common questions we get in the Code Newbie community is, how do I get a job as a programmer? And one of the most common answers is, contribute to open source. It's awesome. Everybody can do it. You can build a portfolio. You can build things that people are actually using. It's a great way to show what you can do and eventually get that first job. Show of hands if you've heard this advice. Show of hands if you've given this advice. <laughs> I guess not a lot of people have asked you. That's OK. Uh, so contribute to open source. So let's take a look at this. What does it really take to contribute to open source? One, you have to know how to code. Now, I know there's lots of other ways you can contribute as well. You can do documentation, and you can do design work, and a bunch of other stuff. But if the goal is to prove your technical abilities, you have to have a certain level of competency in coding to be able to contribute. Number two, communicate. A lot of open source is just communication. right? You're doing code reviews. You're responding. You're asking questions. You're defending your, your code base and your pull requests. So a lot of it has to do with just communication, and especially communication in English. Number three is time. And by time, I really just mean money, because you have to be able to justify spending hours of doing free work. And doing that, and doing it enough so that you actually build a portfolio, probably means that you have some degree of financial stability to justify that decision. 
And number four is a computer. And I know Dave talked earlier about how that's getting a lot cheaper and more affordable, but you still need some type of a machine to do that work. And the fifth one is the internet, right? You have to be able to log in and, uh, and, and push and pull and all that stuff. So if we think about contributing to open source as a class, these are the prerequisites. These are the things that you need to have before you even walk in the room. So how do we get here? How do we get to a place where we have these prerequisites? How did I get here? Let's go back to privilege. I grew up in a upper middle class household. Uh, my, we were born in Ethiopia. My dad came to the United States when I was one, and then my mother and I followed when I was almost three years old. We lived in a really crappy one bedroom apartment in DC, and then when I went to middle school, we moved to a very rich county, one of the richest counties in the United States, and then in high school, we moved to one of the richest parts of one of the richest counties in the United States. My parents were pharmacists, which is awesome, because I get to say they sell drugs. <laughs> and I didn't earn any of that. That came straight from their work and their dedication. So if we think about how living and growing up and that type of socioeconomic stability affects us as adults, we have some research for that. There is a study called Where is the Land of Opportunity? the geography of intergenerational mobility in the United States. And here we see this graph, where on the x-axis we see parent household income, and then on the y-axis we have mean child household income. And we can see a correlation where the more money your parents make, the more money you're likely to make when you become an adult. We see a similar relationship when we talk about parent income rank and college, right? Your likelihood to actually attend college and then on the right side, we have the quality of the college you attend. And we see a similar correlation there as well. And so when I think about what that means for me, it means that I went to a really, really good public school. I was in a magnet program for middle school and high school. And being in that type of environment means that I had very high academic standards. And everyone around me had very high academic standards. There was no question of whether or not you were going to take honors in AP. It was how many are you going to take. I didn't know that college was an option. That was a requirement. Let's talk about college. So I have two degrees, one in uh, a BA in psychology, sorry, a BA in English and a BS in psychology, which are two degrees that I use every single day. And if we look at college education and income, we see a correlation where the higher the degree is, the more money you're likely to make. Unless you have a PhD. I don't know what's up with the doctoral degree category, but they, they're not doing, they're not like fitting the pattern very nicely. Uh, but we see the opposite for unemployment, right? So the higher the degree, the less likely, likely you are to be unemployed. And let's talk about the liberal arts degree. If you have a four-year degree, you likely had a general studies type of class, right? Where you had to do a lot of things that involve collaboration and a lot of research and writing and working in teams and all that good stuff. And what that means is you have strong communication skills. You spent years doing the kinds of things that lead to having very strong communication skills. Let's talk about computer and internet access. I had my first computer with internet when I was nine. I didn't know what to do with it, so I just played a ton of Oregon Trail, <laughs> which is terrible. I hate wagons to this day. And I don't know how my mom knew, but she just knew how important touch typing was going to be. So she made me do Mavis Beacon all the time. I hated her, but she ended up being a very important woman in my life. And when I was in middle school and high school, we didn't have a computer lab. We had many computer labs. We had all Apple products. We had the Adobe Creative Suite. I learned Final Cut Pro when I was 13. I sound like a jerk, don't I? <laughs> Show of hands if you've heard of an internet desert. Couple people, couple people, okay. So an internet desert is when you don't have basic internet speeds. You don't have enough to do basic web functionality like download a photo or do a video chat. I don't know about you, but I do a ton of video chats for a lot of meetings. I don't know where I would be without that capability. 11 million people in the US don't have access to wired broadband. That's a lot of people. If we think about what categories these people fall in, on average, the proportion of the population without internet access is highest in counties with the lowest median household income, the lowest population density, the highest rural population rate, and the highest poverty rate. So we see a connection between internet access and income. 
if you look at this on a worldwide level, less than half of the world's population has internet access. That's a lot of people that we're leaving out. Let's talk about health. Did you get your photo? You good? Okay. Let's talk about health. Uh, health is one of those things that honestly, I didn't really think much about. As you can see, I got all my limbs. They're like kind of pathetic limbs, but they work, mom. Um, and I have all my senses, and I've never really had to, to think too much about it. And that's one of those things that, again, I didn't earn. I definitely didn't earn, because I don't exercise at all. I will take the elevator to the second floor. Don't play with me. <laughs> when we think a little bit about health, we have 1 million people in the United States who are functionally deaf, 360 million in the world, 1.3 million in the US who are legally blind, 39 million in the world, 1 in 12 men who are colorblind, 1 in 200 women. And what that means is, there's the accessibility component, which I think is kind of the obvious one, right? You can't do the things that you might want to do. You, you, know, you can't navigate the way that um, other people might. But there's also a financial impact that I didn't appreciate until I had friends who were going through some very serious health concerns. And there's a financial impact of just health bills. But there's the fact that you have to pay the opportunity. There's an opportunity cost to not being able to actually work and generate income. And then there's a third one, which is emotional stress. Right, which is just being kind of trapped in this body that won't let you do what you want to do and won't let you be who you want to be. And that's a huge, huge part of it as well. Let's talk about money. Uh, my parents paid for my college. Uh, try telling immigrant parents they're going to pay for your English degree. That was fun. Uh, but they paid for, my, for my, uh, my college, which meant that I didn't have to worry about certain things. Uh, when we think about student debt in the United States, 40 million people have $1.2 trillion in student debt, which comes out to about $30,000 per person. That's a lot of money. That's huge. And that can really impact a lot of the decisions that you make later on as an adult. Um, we can see that college student loans are the highest besides mortgage uh, in terms of the money that we owe. And that happened recently. That happened about looks like six years ago. So there's a survey uh, where 52% of people strongly agreed or somewhat agreed with the statement, my need to pay student loan debt is hampering my ability to further my career. And I've seen this happen with my own group of friends and people that I grew up with as well, where they had to take the first job they could get out of college. They just had to. There was no room to take a gap year and find yourself. You couldn't take an unpaid internship. You had to do what you needed to do to make sure that you could take care of yourself. For me, it meant that I didn't have to get a job. I could focus on building a career. And years later, that meant that I could learn to code. I could take the time and have a bit of a safety net to take months off and learn to code, and years later be here and talk to you all. So going back to that question, how did I get here? I'm really, really lucky. And I bet a lot of you are really, really lucky too. And people hate hearing that. People hate hearing that. People want to believe that hard work is all it takes, right? I worked really, really hard to get here, and I was one of those people. And my husband would tell me all the time, he'd say, yeah, OK, sure, fine. You work hard. But luck has played a role in your success. And I'd say, no, uh, no, it didn't. <laughs> and we had this conversation enough times that eventually uh, I decided to do some, some mulling over uh, and some, some research. I read tons of articles. Uh, also known as tweets, and <laughs> you know you do it too. And I kept coming across this tension between this idea of luck and this idea of hard work. And there were all these celebrities telling me, I got here because I worked really, really hard. I think that's actually Kevin Hart's bio says, I got here because I worked really, really hard. But here's the thing. I recently left my job at Microsoft. Hi, Dad. Uh, three months ago to work on Code Newbie full time. And when I was there, I was a program manager for something called Tech Jobs Academy. And it was a four month free technical training program for people who were unemployed or underemployed. And we found people, 25 people, who were very passionate and excited about technology and just for one reason or another never got a chance to really break in. And guess what I learned about people who are unemployed and underemployed? They work really hard too. They work super hard. I had one of my favorite graduates uh, is this woman who had four kids. And for years, she found 
time, one hour here and there, to read a chapter of a tech book, to get services that were free from the government, to go to the library, just very, very slowly and gradually build her tech career. So by the time I was strolling into my cushy Microsoft job at 11 a.m., she'd already fed four people, okay? She works really hard, too. I'm really, really lucky that I never had to worry about where my next meal was coming from. I was really lucky that I grew up with a level of security and exposure and support so that as an adult, I could take my unburdened shoulders and I could lean in to my work. I was lucky first so I could work hard later. So what happens when technology is dictated by the lucky? What happens when those of us who are statistically better positioned to be successful are the ones who decide how everyone else interacts with technology? When we decide what they do and how they access their memories? You get this. Show of hands if you, sh if you watch uh, Silicon Valley. Show of hands, awesome. Do y'all remember the scene? I love this scene so much. I love this scene so much. I love it because it captures everything I hate and I love about technology, right? So the story is the, um, the main guy, he, he's interviewing for a position, and they sit him down and they go, oh, this is mind-blowing technology. It's gonna, it's, just, it's gonna blow your mind. It's so incredible. We're just changing the world. And they sit him down and they give him a little controller and it's just like a mustache filter. That's the whole thing, it's just mustaches. And, uh, and, and he goes, I, I don't get it. You, you said you were changing the world and it's just really cool stuff. And they go, oh, don't worry. There's different kinds of mustaches. <laughs> And the thing is, mustache filters are super fun. I think I'd look really good in a mustache filter, I'm just saying. They're really, really awesome. But this reminds me of the problems that we're solving, right? What problems are we solving by having a mustache filter? I think that we tend to solve problems that we understand the best. And usually those are the ones that we experience ourselves. And if we have those problems, and chances are we know people who have those problems. I love talking about my problems. It's one of my favorite things. You just sit around and you just complain all day. Um, I will warn you, though, don't try and tell my husband your problems, because he does this weird thing where he tries to solve them. And I'm like, that's, that's obviously not the point of talking about your problems. Um, and so we tend to solve problems that we personally experience. So what do we do? with our luck. We have all this luck and we have this issue where we're just looking at our own issues, what can we do? We can expand our problem pool. And this can mean a lot of different things to a lot of people, but at the end of the day, it boils down to expanding your problem pool. Because the more exposure we have to different problems that are outside of our immediate vantage point, then we are more likely to share and spread that luck. So there's a few ways that we can do that. One is to follow people who are not like you. Um, I think Twitter is awesome for this. There are tons of Twitter lists that kind of collect people by different, uh, different metrics and different themes. Uh, I, like half the people I follow on Twitter, frankly, I don't even like them. Uh, I just follow them because I know that their perspectives and opinions are different from mine, and I want to have exposure to that. So I highly recommend it. Uh, one of my favorite, I mean, you can pick people who just look different, uh, come from different industries. My favorite is I love following people who are bilingual and who sometimes tweet in a language that is not English. And it's just a humbling reminder to know that not everyone speaks literally the language that you do and what it feels like to not always understand people. So I highly encourage that. Number two is to volunteer. Uh, I get most of my news from Twitter moments. Uh, and I, I know way too much about Kim Kardashian. Um, but Volunteering is one of those things where you're not just reading about someone's problems. It's not, you know, there's no distance there. But when you volunteer, whether it's at the local library or at a rails bridge or an organization like that, you get to meet people who might come from a different background and get to know them as human beings and not just as statistics. And number three is to amplify voices. There are lots of really great people doing a lot of the heavy lifting. Uh, you know, a couple of them we talked about early on in this talk. But just a simple retweet goes a long way. Recommending them for a job or an opportunity or a grant or a speaking gig can really help those people out. OK, so your problem pool is expanded. Success. So now what do you do? One thing you can do is you can actually try and solve all those problems yourself. But there's also ways that we can take that information and incorporate it into your product. So one obvious way is to think about accessibility. So are the tools that we're using easy to use if I'm using a screen reader? Am I using alt text correctly? Things like that. 
And then it's considering internet speeds. Are my, are my files small? Does my page load very quickly? And then the third one, I think you'll appreciate this because this is the Ruby community, is conventions, right? Creativity is awesome sometimes, uh, but a lot of times just use things that people expect and use it in the way that they expect to, uh, to use them. And this might be just simple user flows. You know, if, you, if you're trying to have a window and kind of trying to close the window, put an X there. Don't put like a smiley face. That's just weird and, and not helpful to anyone. Uh, but simple things like that, using conventions and especially symbols and icons so that you don't have to know English to use your product. And there are some awesome examples of ways to expand your problem pool and ways to uh, make sure that your technology and your products are accessible to everyone. One is Code for America. Show of hands if you have heard of Code for America. Awesome. Oh, that's a lot of people. Yay. Code for America is great. Uh, and what I love about what they do is they, uh, they've been around, I think, for over six years. I believe they've worked with tons of local agencies, local government agencies. And they have a great website where you can see the different community problems that they've solved with technology. It's a great way to learn more, to figure out how technology is applicable. Uh, and it's just it's an incredible website to check out. The next is the 18F blog. Show of hands if you've heard of 18F. No, look at Y'all are so informed. I love it. So 18F is great because their whole thing is trying to be a lot more transparent and trying to uh, use technology to solve civic problems. And their blog is great because they tell you how they do that. They tell you the problems they encounter, what's worked, what hasn't worked. They try to keep a lot of things open. It's a great way to figure out how to merge uh, privilege with technology and coding skills. And the third is the Big Apps competition in New York City. Show of hands, have you heard of this one? OK, that's very good. A couple people. Uh, so I love this competition a lot. It's, it happens every single year in New York City. And it's a year-long competition where they pick a handful of big city problems. So it might be housing. Uh, it, it might be you know, internet accessibility. It might be voting registration, you know, kind of big problems. And they have people create products, and you can win prizes. The best part about this is they record a lot of the competition, and they have a lot of open public events. So if you're looking for inspiration and things that just everyday developers are doing to help out, definitely check out. Um, they, they have a website and a page for that as well. So expand your pool and share the luck. So in this talk, you might think that I'm speaking about diversity. Show of hands if you got that impression. A couple people? OK. So let me be very, very clear. Uh, this is not a diversity conversation. I don't like the word diversity because it emphasizes differences. And it draws lines between us. It assumes that there is an other, a normal, and an other. And that's just not accurate. That's not the world that we live in. I much prefer the term inclusion. Because inclusion demands that we think about everyone. It demands that we continually ask the question, who are we leaving out? Who's not at the table? Who should we be inviting? Inclusion is a worthy and a very elusive goal. And I believe that if we can think about ways to include everyone at the table and invite everyone to that table, we are much, much more likely to create products that are helpful to everyone. And in that way, we can all be a little more lucky. Thank you. Did I do questions? Yeah, sure. I have a question while they're thinking about it, which mm -hmm. is uh, you briefly mentioned like doing Code Newbie full time. What does that mean? <laughs> Just tweeting? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yes. Um, no, so Code Newbie, we started, uh, I started about three, almost three years ago now. And it started as a Twitter chat. And it was a way for people to connect who are also learning to code but don't have a supportive structure, like, you know, if they're going to a boot camp and things like that. And so every night, every Wednesday night for one hour, we would tweet with the hashtag Code Newbie. And so we've, been, we've done 133 Twitter chats, I believe. And about two years ago, we launched the podcast. We've had yourself and a few other people on. Uh, but we're actually doing our first conference in April, so April 21 and 22nd in New York City. Uh, and so I'm working on that. We're working on a new podcast show. And we're doing a couple of chapters in different cities. So stuff. Uh, sponsorships. People like you. Sponsorships. <laughs> <laughs> Genius.
Um, I had a question. Um, is this talk available online? Will be, yeah. Uh, probably like oh, uh, yeah. a couple weeks. It's very inspirational, and I won't say anything terrible about you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Other questions? Down low. Dorrance. You can shout out. Yeah, Raphael's on the way. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying um, thank you because uh, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, but I actually, uh, two questions. One, do you think the internet should be free for everyone to use? And, um, oh boy. Okay. <laughs> and um, those, uh, those YouTube comments are like really terrible, but do you find that um, when you read something like that, that you realize that you think you're, you're doing something right? And, I don't know, does that, it sort yeah. of like empower you in a way? That's a good question. Um, hmm. Hmm. Okay, so, so I'm gonna answer the second one first because that's way easier than the first one. Um, the second one, I remember when I, when I read that and I, I looked at my husband and I was like, it happened. Like that was my first reaction was like, it happened, it finally happened. Uh, and we were figuring out what to do about it and he said, you should put it in your, in your talk. So I think, I think the empowerment part happens when I can openly talk about it. You know what I mean? Because there are a couple different reasons why I decided to put it in my slide. One, because this is not my problem, this is our problem. So if I need to read that comment, you need to read that comment too. Um, two, because you know, I have a big mouth, I have a podcast, I, I talk a lot, and I want other people who might have experienced that to know that I, I'm there too and I'm with you. And I think it's, it's a lot better for all of us if this becomes something that we openly talk about and we openly share. So I think the empowerment part comes when we're comfortable talking about it and maybe even like poking fun at it a little bit, um, not to take away from the seriousness of the issue, but to, to show that we're not going to let that quiet us. I think that's where the power comes in. Um, I really don't want to answer the first question. Uh, I think internet's really awesome and everyone should have it. I think there's probably lots of consequences to it being free that I haven't fully thought out yet, but I like the idea of it being very accessible. One more question? I could ask you questions cool. all day, but we'll wrap up. Cool, uh, yeah. Thank you. No we have a, a micro clap. Three, two, one. Okay. Oh, can I say one more thing? Yeah. Okay. It's a revolution. Uh, revolution has started. Uh, one more thing. If I, if I know you from Twitter, please say hi to me, because I get like really sad when I leave and I, I don't get to see people that I will never see again. So please come say hi to me, and like I, I would love to meet you. So. Thank <laughs> you.